We are back. Welcome back, Left Reckoners. I'm Matt Leck. With me, as always, David Griscom. Uh, David, how are you doing? Not too bad, brother. How about yourself? I'm doing very, very well today because we are joined by the author of one of my favorite books of this year. The title of it is The uh, St. Louis Commune of 1877, Communism is the Heartland. Uh, author Mark Kruger, thank you so much for joining us, Mark. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, like I said, this is a, you know, I'm a, I'm a Great Plains boy uh, myself. So this sort of uh, history that I think, you know, we, we, we as leftists get into a lot of European history and stuff like that, but we don't often uh, understand how this stuff was playing out domestically. And your book is a great uh, encapsulation of that. So just to give us, before we go into sort of the origins of the St. Louis Commune, give us the sort of overview of this, of how like superlative this event was. Marxists in charge of St. Louis, right? It's uh, you right. have the um, general now, strike. Like this is yeah. an amazing thing that I think is submerged a little bit by history. Well, through the years, I'd, I'd read some labor history, and it, you know, they always had a, a, a small paragraph or a few sentences about, and in St. Louis, workers took control of the city. You know, and I thought, <laughs> well, that's interesting. Why haven't I seen more about that? You know, mm -hmm. so um, what happened? Uh, why it's important, I think, is is that the St. Louis Commune represented the first general strike in American history, and not many people know that, uh, where all the workers in the city went out on strike, shut the city down, and actually took over the city. Uh, also, it was the only time in American history where a communist party ruled the city, and uh, both of those happened. Uh, so that in and of itself, I think, is important. But the other, the other things about the commune uh, are that this was a very racist period in American history, the 1870s, right after the Civil War. And uh, in, the, in the St. Louis strike, uh, all these workers came together, um, foreigners, Germans, Irish, um, French, Bohemian, uh, and blacks and whites all came together to cooperate in that strike. And that was very unusual for the time. Um, in addition, it brought to uh, American workers uh, European socialism that uh, uh, it wasn't really a part of the American working class at the time. And uh, when the Working Men's Party, which was a Marxist party, took over the city of St. Louis, that really introduced Marxist socialism to uh, um, to the Midwest, certainly, and to the United States generally. Yeah, so let's back up then to the Paris Commune. And, you know, Marx writes the specter of communism was haunting Europe. Uh, give us a sense of, you know, how the degree to which it was haunting America too. And particularly, like, uh, I'm interested in the utopian uh, socialism as well, uh, how that played into. Give us a little bit of the uh, how of the... Well, first, maybe you should define for folks the Paris Commune uh, and then how it was uh, uh, playing out for folks here in the States. Well, in 1871, um, uh, Louis uh, Bonaparte decided to attack Prussia, and, uh, and he did, and uh, the war was over in about a month, and he was taken uh, prisoner in Sedan uh, when the Prussians beat the French, and the, uh, uh, that ended the Second Empire in France and created the uh, Second Republic. And what happened was that uh, the people of Paris uh, were just um, uh, disgusted with the way the French had caved in to the Prussians. And the Prussians made them pay a, a large amount of money for the cost of the war. They made them cede Alsace and Lorraine to, uh, to Prussia. And the people of Paris refused to go along with it. So they held out and they were attacked then by the Prussians. And the French government, they set up the Paris Commune and that was the, uh, the government of the workers in the city of Paris. And they set out uh, a number of things uh, uh, to do. And one of them was to create social legislation to help the poor, to have secular education, women's rights, um, and uh, a local autonomy. Uh, and that sort of thing. Well, when they did that, the government of France moved out of Paris and moved to Versailles. And the workers took over the city of Paris, established the Paris Commune, and ran the city for about three months before the French forces gathered together again and uh, attacked, uh, uh, massacring 
really the uh, the mm. Parisians. So the Paris Commune was a big uh, story among working class people uh, at the time because it was uh, really the first time workers had taken control of a major city and try to set up a, a workers' government, a socialist government. Um, so that was the Paris Commune. Um, it was made up uh, of anarchists, of Marxists, socialists, communists, liberals, uh, all kinds of people were in the leadership of the organization. And they had a compromise with each other. You know, some of them believed in revolutionary cells that uh, should be secret and set about uh, 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 making a revolution in France. Uh, others didn't, and uh, there were anarchists that didn't want to get into politics at all. They just wanted to set up uh, economic uh, 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 entities. Uh, so you had all these people trying to come together and make a government, and they succeeded in doing that until they were crushed by the, uh, by the forces of the French army. So when news of that got out, the media uh, was largely located in Versailles. There weren't a whole lot of them in Paris, mm -hmm. and they told the story of the Paris Commune from the uh, viewpoint of the, of the uh, French government. And um, in the United States, it was a real scare story. It was uh, these crazy uh, communists had taken over the city. They were there was bloodshed all over the place, which there actually wasn't when the uh, when the French uh, communards uh, took control of the city. There was uh, hardly any violence in the city at all. The violence came when the French government took it back, <clears throat> and it was estimated that they had killed thirty thousand to a hundred thousand Parisians when they took back the city of Paris. But the, the information coming to the United States was that these crazy workers, communists had taken over, they were taking away the property of, of the rich people, and uh, they, uh, it, was, it was anarchy. It was total anarchy, and it was something to be very afraid of. And uh, uh, by the time of the St. Louis Commune, that was only six years later. So you can see that that was still in the minds of the, of the rich uh, when the St. Louis Commune came to be. With the utopian socialists, you know, they had been in the United States for a long time. Started in Europe, in France, actually. And these were people that were pretty much reacting to the industrialization of uh, Europe. And uh, uh, they rebelled against the materialism, uh, the mechanization. And they wanted to set up little communities uh, where they could live their lives without exploiting each other uh, with wage labor and uh, uh, having a democracy that they could control and uh, no kings, no uh, uh, people to uh, oppress them. And they set those up and there were a number of them in the United States. I mean, the United States was full of, uh, of these little communities. You had the uh, Icarians in Nauvoo, Illinois. They also had a community in St. Louis. Um, the uh, Oneida community in upstate New York the uh, Amanda community in, in uh, Iowa, um, uh, the Harmonists in Pennsylvania, New Harmony in Indiana. I mean, they were all over the place. Even Thoreau had said that there was hardly a person walking around that didn't have a, a plan for a community in his pocket. You know, so there were all traditional <laughs> communities that were being set up all over the country. And they were socialist in nature. So that mm -hmm. they were really the first uh, socialists in the United States. Yeah, ha uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne in the Blythedale Romance makes fun of one of these communities um, that right. was influenced by Fourier. Uh, and it was interesting because that's where I first came across Charles Fourier, uh, a French, I believe, utopian socialist. Right. Uh, and to see that his ideas were very active in this, uh, in inspiring folks, was very interesting. There were Fourier communities everywhere. I mean, everybody, even Horace Greeley was uh, believed in, uh, in Fourier's communities. So Fourier was probably the most successful of all of them. You're right. And talk about uh, the German immigration uh, uh, to America and how that sort of brought these ideas. Well, the Germans had, had come as, as early as the colonies, but there was a big, <clears throat> a big German movement in the 1830s. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them uh, settled in Missouri. <laughs> and uh, uh, some of the Germans that settled there actually went back to Germany, wrote books and pamphlets, <laughs> saying that uh, Missouri was just like Germany. There were all kinds of Germans there. There were, uh, well, not mountains, but hills. And uh, uh, you could grow wine there, and uh, uh, people spoke German, and so on and so forth. And so in the 1830s, a lot of Germans moved to the United States and also to St. Louis. 
But the it, the big influx that that affected the St. Louis Commune came after the 1848 revolutions in Europe, especially mm. the one in Germany in 1848, because the revolution failed and these revolutionaries had to leave the country. And so many of them came to the United States. And uh, one of them that came to St. Louis was a guy named Joseph Weidemeyer. And he was a Marxist, a friend of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. And uh, uh, he, he was trying to decide where to settle in the United States. And uh, Engels told him, uh, don't go to Philadelphia, it's too parochial, go to St. Louis. There's a big German community, you'll feel at home there, hmm. German culture, German language, that sort of thing. So a lot of the German revolutionaries after 1848 came to St. Louis and uh, they, uh, they were very anti-slavery. Uh, they, uh, uh, they fought in the uh, um, Civil War on, uh, uh, for the Union. A number of them were generals in the Union Army. And uh, they uh, uh, they ended up leading really the the uh, uh, the St. Louis Commune and the Working Men's Party of the United States, which took control of the strike in 1877. And and how large uh, was the like the population in St. Louis of more like German speaking peoples at the time of the the Commune? In 1877, percent of the people in were born in another country. And a third of the mm. people were born in Germany. So, so St. Louis at that time, it was the fourth city in the country. It's only gone downhill since then. But it was the fourth largest city in the country. There was even a meeting uh, 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 with the idea of moving the nation's capital to St. Louis. The city was growing so quickly. And uh, uh, it was a very, uh, it was a strong manufacturing city. It, uh, it served uh, by trade. Uh, it served eastern cities with western products, and uh, it also served the west and the south with the Mississippi River and people stopping in St. Louis on their way west. So it was a very successful city at that time, and uh, it was very heavily uh, immigrant and very heavily German. Yeah, you mentioned the uh, Civil War uh, context of this, and that's the, one of the things I find so fascinating. As a Bismarck, North Dakota native, we had Custer <clears throat> arrive alongside Thomas Lafayette Rosser, a Confederate general, and they were uh, putting the Northern Pacific through the uh, the Northern Plains, and you know, ultimately turning the guns of the Civil War onto Native American folks. And you mentioned that there's a similar dynamic here, where you have certain members, <laughs> you have a Federalist and Confederate unity to strike some of these crushes. But maybe let's not, well, let's, before we get to that, let's talk about the post-Civil War economic context that is leading up to this a little bit. Well, the Civil War is largely a, a fight between Southern aristocrats, feudal aristocrats, and Northern capitalists. The North is beginning to develop capitalism. The South is stuck in this slave society uh, of feudalism and uh, uh, and the South had controlled the federal government up until the Civil War, until Lincoln was elected. So when Lincoln's elected, the South kind of sees the writing on the wall that they're going to lose control and they begin seceding from the Union. So the South, after the Civil War, is totally decimated. Uh, the slave society becomes a sharecropping society. Um, uh, the, the, the slave uh, owners are... Uh, the, the slaves are taking over the plantations, at least during Reconstruction. Uh, but in the North is, is where the really important things are happening. And corporations are being formed, and capitalism is expanding at breakneck speed in the North, especially railroads. And with corporations, the idea behind the corporations was that in the beginning, you could form a corporation with state support, uh, if it was for a, uh, a beneficial purpose, like you needed a bridge uh, mm -hmm. someplace. So it was good for the community. So they allowed you to form a corporation, pull your money, not be responsible uh, 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 as far as being sued, and, uh, uh, and, and, and it was encouraged. But then uh, corporations expanded, and the whole idea of a corporation was to make money for its shareholders. That was its sole purpose for existing. And it didn't care, you know, what effect it had on the community, on the people that worked for it, whatever. Profit was the most important thing. And so these corporations then were growing at breakneck speed. They were expanding. 
especially the railroads. So you have the Pennsylvania Railroad, which was one of the largest corporations in the world at the time, the New York Central, the Baltimore and Ohio, uh, all these railroads going west, making a whole lot of money, uh, taking land from the Indians uh, for their railroads. Uh, the, it was important for them if they wanted to establish communities along the line to clear the Indians out. And so you get that uh, uh, everything coming together as a result of this corporatization of American society. And the large corporations are really taking over. And so you have, for example, in the Grant administration, all these scandals with the large corporations. Um, and uh, uh, ultimately, that's going to result in the strike of 1877 by railroad workers and then other workers and, uh, and the St. Louis Commune. And uh, in the lead up to 1877, what were the sort of labor organizing? Uh, we already talked on, and you can mention a little bit more about the Marxist uh, influence. Uh, you also talk about co-ops in your book and that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. The the uh, unions really came after industrialization, and so uh, as a result, as uh, uh, as as artisans and skilled workers. Uh, began to die off, uh, factories arose. And so you had, for example, an artisan uh, making his product from beginning to end and taking pride in his work and controlling his working environment. It was either in his home or in the workplace where he had control of it. And then as capital uh, is invested, uh, capitalists are, are, are opening larger factories and they have machinery, and then we've got steam power and machinery, and now you can make these products uh, in a factory, and you can do it with machines, which makes it faster and cheaper, and these artisans are being put out of work, and so what they end up doing is having to uh, go to work in the factories as wage laborers. Now they don't control their product anymore, they don't control the working conditions, they work for wages, which are totally out of their control, and uh, you have then the beginnings of some unions where they try to organize in order to protect themselves. But by the 1830s, there's unions, but they're very weak. And they're usually in skilled trades. So you don't have like the CIO where you have all workers in an industry joining the union. Uh, they're mostly for, uh, for the skilled people. In the railroad industry, you have the engineers union, uh, the brakeman's union. Um, and, uh, you know, the engineers get paid more, they think they're better than the others, and so on and so forth. So you have these early unions, but they're not very strong, and they don't really unite all the workers. Mm -hmm. As the years go on, um, they get stronger. But even then, you know, uh, in the 1840s, you have a big uh, strike of textile workers in Rhode Island, uh, women workers, and uh, where they, they had nine-year-olds uh, working in the factory 16 hours a day, women working 16 hours a day. And uh, they have a big strike in 1840. And then by the, by the end of the Civil War, you've got the uh, National Labor Union is founded in 1866, the Knights of Labor in 1869, um, the, uh, uh, the Grangers in 1867. So you get these big unions, and the National Labor Union and the Knights of Labor uh, are very, very progressive unions. They, <clears throat> a lot of unions at the time wouldn't admit black people as members, uh, and, uh, and there were separate unions for black people. But the Knights of Labor and the National Labor Union went after uh, and tried to enlist blacks into their union, and women also, two groups that have been left out of the early unions. Uh, so the unions are getting stronger and broader and more mature by the 1870s. Um, the, uh, the cooperatives uh, were a part of the uh, uh, labor, un uh, labor movement where, uh, where workers tried to set up their own businesses uh, in certain industries where they could work the businesses uh, without exploiting each other. Uh, they were sort of nonprofit. There were producers' cooperatives where they would make the uh, <clears throat> make the items, produce the items, and there were consumer cooperatives where you could buy things without somebody making a profit. And so, as a result, that was also a big part of the labor movement, where workers tried to set up these things where they could work in these cooperatives and not be exploited. They could buy at these cooperatives and not be exploited. 
And uh, a group called the Sovereigns of Industry was very big in trying to set those up. There were hundreds of cooperatives all over the country and all kinds of different businesses. So let's talk about the, uh, the I guess, what brought off the general strike first in 1877? Um, basically, like, tra was it my, I guess my reading is of your work is uh, stresses on the rail workers getting more, I mean, obviously a very dangerous job um, and uh, what, what, how does this bubble up? Right. If, if, I, if, if I can go back just a little bit and bring in all the factors that I think uh, came together at one time to create the St. Louis Commune. Um, the 1848 revolutions in Europe and those people, radicals and revolutionaries coming to the United States and in St. Louis in particular. Because one of the things I always wondered was, why does this general strike and uh, a communist party taking over the city occur in St. Louis. Why not in Chicago? Why not in New York? Why St. Louis? And so one of the reasons is all of these German revolutionaries and French revolutionaries that came to St. Louis after the 1848 revolutions, and also the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, so that you get uh, uh, Czechs, Bohemians, uh, also in St. Louis as part of the uh, part of the commune. So you've got that uh, that occurs. Then the, 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 uh, the Paris commune is an example to these workers of what could be, that they could mm -hmm. set up a community and run it without exploiting each other. In 1864, Karl Marx organizes the first international, the International Workingmen's Association in London. And the idea is to unite workers across national lines uh, internationally. And so the headquarters is in London, but in 1872, he moves the headquarters to New York City. And he does that because he's afraid that the anarchists in Europe are gonna try to take over the organization. So he moves it to New York. Then in 1873, after this expansion of capitalism, there's a horrible depression, big depression in 1873. And it goes on and on and on. Million people, millions of people are out of work. They're, they're riding the rails, they're going walking from town to town, a lot of unemployed people. And the rail, railroad companies, which were the, the richest corporations and the strongest, um, in order to maximize their profits, they use the, uh, the depression as an excuse to cut wages. And the Pennsylvania Railroad and the New York Central, um, New York Central is owned by Vanderbilt, uh, they cut wages three times uh, in a 12 month period mm -hmm. so that workers are making half as much as they were making uh, before the pay cuts. Uh, and they, you know, they weren't getting rich before the pay cuts, but after the pay cuts, they, they couldn't live on what they were making. And so <clears throat> the railroad industry is, is going to explode. And uh, so the depression, the railroad industry, all these things come together in St. Louis, uh, in 1877. The strike begins in uh, Martinsburg, West Virginia in, 18, in, uh, in July of 1877. It uh, starts at the same time pretty much in Baltimore, and then it moves west. You know, uh, workers along the railroad lines from town to town hear about what happened 30 miles away, then they begin to go out on strike, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it begins moving west. And uh, in, in, in less than a week, it reaches East St. Louis, Illinois, which was the big railroad center uh, for St. Louis, uh, on, right on the other side of the Mississippi River from, uh, from the city of St. Louis. And uh, on July 21st, uh, they vote, railroad workers in East St. Louis vote to strike, vote to support the strike. And 400 workers from um, St. Louis ferry across the river to East St. Louis to join them. And uh, of course, the strike then moves to St. Louis also. So, <clears throat> In less than a week, it had moved all the way to St. Louis, and it continues going west all the way to San Francisco. So you've got uh, a massive, massive railroad strike across. Now, St. Louis was a little bit different in the sense that uh, in Baltimore, Chicago, and Pittsburgh, the railroad strike was extremely violent. Hmm. The uh, uh, in St. Louis, there was very little violence, but in St. Louis, it became a general strike where it hadn't in those other cities, and 
the Working Men's Party, which was formed in 1876. The first international had been moved to New York in 1872. By 1876, they closed it down, but they formed the Working Men's Party of the United States, a Marxist political party. And there were about a thousand members of that party in St. Louis in 1877. And a lot of these people were active in the First International. They were communists. And mm -hmm. so uh, the Working Men's Party takes over the strike, the railroad strike in St. Louis, um, enlarges it to a general strike, closes the whole city down. Nothing is coming in or going out of the city. There's not one business that's operating. Uh, and this communist party is, uh, is running the city. So all of those factors come together in one place. Uh, uh, to create the St. Louis Commune. And I mean, I, I want to hear a bit more about like the way that they were running the, the city after, you know, creating the commune there and, and all of that. But, you know, I also just want to note too, that like what's interesting about like the role of, of the communists there um, is that, you know, folks have to remember that during this time, like in the American labor movement, like, you know, the friendship between labor and capital was still like a very, very popular idea and ended up being a popular idea across mm -hmm. American labor organizing, you know, all the way up until like the early you know, 1900s. I mean, if I recall correctly, I mean, Debs um, at this point in his life too was a labor um, and capital friendship person. So it really seems that it took, um, I don't know, like a, a, a understanding that the interests of capital and labor are always going to be at odds with each other. Um, that sort of has to come from that more radical European communist tradition to sort of be able to spur people into, into saying, okay, well, here's the opening, here's the space, and we're going to take uh, matters into our own hands. Yeah, the, uh, even in the first international, one of the sections in the international was led by a woman, Victoria Woodhull, and uh, she, uh, she wanted to let capitalists into her section of the international because uh, she said, well, they know more about capitalism. So, you know, why not bring them in? Uh, a lot of the early socialists did want to see some kind of cooperation, uh, but that I, I think that didn't apply to the Marxists. You know, Karl Marx did not see uh, labor uh, cooperating with capital. Uh, uh, labor was going to overthrow capital in a violent revolution. And uh, uh, the Working Men's Party... Uh, was led basically by Marxists. So you get, even though they didn't make a revolution, and I have to say they didn't really try to make a revolution, and that raises the whole question about whether one city within the United States can make itself a uh, little communist mm -hmm. island, you know. Uh, but they, uh, uh, the speeches that were given during the St. Louis Commune were very, very anti-capitalist very, very uh, supportive of communism. And they talked in terms of well, not only communism, but the French Revolution. Heads will roll, they said, you know. Mm. Uh, it's time for the people to act, to take control. Uh, so they were talking about uh, a, a violent takeover, if necessary. Uh, one of them said he'd rather die, in, uh, uh, rather die in a fight than starve to death. So... Uh, uh, the Marxists that led the St. Louis Commune, I think, were, were willing to, uh, well, at least verbally were willing to go farther. Uh, they didn't want to cooperate with capital, but they didn't do a whole lot to overthrow it either. Mm. Yeah. Matt, you're muted, so we can't hear you. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask about that. So as far as policies uh, and demands and also, uh, you know, public relations, uh, you know, like you mentioned, they allowed passenger uh, cars through so they didn't, you know, upset the public. Yeah, talk about those sorts of uh, uh, factors. Well, they, the, the railroad strike was, uh, was a strike of freight. They weren't going to allow any freight to go forward anywhere in the, in the country. And, uh, but they realized they didn't want to turn off the general population. So they let passenger cars go through. They didn't want to give the federal government an excuse to uh, put them down. So they allowed the mail to go through. The railroads themselves said, oh, we can't uh, get the mail through because these workers are on strike, uh, trying to get the federal government to intervene. Uh, the workers said, look, we'll carry the mail ourselves. They wrote a letter to the president or sent a telegram to the president, will carry the mail if the railroad companies don't want to do it. Uh, they didn't want the federal government to intervene. 
They didn't want to give them a federal issue to intervene. And uh, they didn't want to inconvenience the general public and turn people against them. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a letter that I, uh, I quote in the book that uh, uh, where these, uh, the trains were shut down and uh, the railroad blamed the workers. They told the people, well, you're stranded here now, but it's the workers' fault. They're on strike. And uh, the letter, the, the editor was written by one of the passengers who said, uh, you know, the workers took up a collection to pay for hotel rooms for all of us and bought us dinner and uh, tried to make our life easier. And it wasn't them that caused the problem. It was a railroad company themselves. So mm -hmm. I think they, they made an, an effort not to inconvenience the general public, to get the public on their side. And they largely had the public on their side. And uh, a lot of places tried to bring in uh, militias to put down the strikers. And many of the militias uh, refused to do anything. A lot of them gave their guns to the uh, strikers and left town. Uh, they, uh, they couldn't count on the militias. In the Pittsburgh strike, um, the militias refused to suppress the Pittsburgh strikers. So they brought in uh, militias from Philadelphia to, uh, to, to put, down the, uh, put down the strike uh, because the local people wouldn't do it. The merchants were donating food to the strikers. Uh, not only workers, but people from the communities were going out and blocking freight trains to keep them from running. So the communities were very much uh, in support of the strikers. Yeah, that that part's really fascinating. The um, the demands which are, you mentioned are like uh, you know eight hour workdays and that sort of stuff versus the hysterical exaggeration and red baiting by the press um, to basically try to stoke this federal intervention. And you also cite um, a sort of officials saying, "Look, we'll go uh, impose order and then find a law for it later." Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we'll arrest them now and then. Uh, uh, we'll try to find some basis for it later on because we know it's illegal, you know. Um, mm. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I found the, the, it very interesting that uh, in the uh, 1870s, uh, the language of the, uh, uh, the, the rich people in the state was the same as it was in the 1950s McCarthy period. There was mm. total red baiting, uh, you know, these uh, communists or... Uh, are going to slaughter all of us uh, kind of uh, thing. Karl Marx had said that uh, the First International was being blamed for everything that happened in the world. And uh, he said even the Chicago fire was blamed on the First International. And uh, he said uh, it's a wonder that the, that the uh, hurricane that hit, I think it was Bermuda, wasn't blamed on the First International. <laughs> you know? So, uh, so they were, uh, it, it was not unlike uh, today where they were just blaming communists for everything. Yeah. I mean, I those terrible bit... communists, those terrible <laughs> communists giving these people ideas that maybe children shouldn't have to be working in the factory 16 yeah, I mean, hours a day. Yeah, to be in school or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that I'll was... Talk about... okay, in, sorry. In St. Louis, the big demands were for the eight-hour day and the end of child labor. I mean, those were the two big ones. They also wanted wow. nationalization of the transportation system because the railroad uh, company said they couldn't they couldn't operate them at a profit. And they said, well, let us operate them. Uh, the people who operated at, at a profit. But uh, the eight hour day and child labor were the two big issues. Talk a little bit about the elite, uh, like sort of capitalist response. You got Vanderbilt. Uh, it was a Gould who said he'll just pay one half of the working class to uh, fight the other. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, Jay Cook, the, uh, I could pay half the working class to kill the other half. Um, it, it was a very, very arrogant uh, attitude. Um, Vanderbilt, the workers tried over and over to meet with Vanderbilt and explain the problems they were having and try to work out a solution, and he refused to meet with them. As a matter of fact, when, when a committee would come to talk to him, he'd fire the whole committee. Um, the uh, refused to talk to him, and the reason was... Um, uh, there was a telegram from, um, I think, the Federal Receiver for Railroads in St. Louis, uh, who said that they weren't going to give in an inch, uh, the workers weren't going to be running the company, uh, and that he'd just as soon have the showdown now as later. And I think the idea was that they weren't going to give an inch because they felt that they were stronger than the working class at the time, 
and that they could get the federal government to intervene on their behalf. So they didn't have to give anything up. Uh, and uh, uh, they would just as soon have, have the confrontation and crush the workers uh, at that moment rather than give in to them and have to fight another day. It's really remarkable seeing, you know, requests for Gatling guns and things like that from uh, from uh, local governments and, and things. I like know, that. and remember, and remember, like for example, in St. Louis, there was really no violence. Mm. There was no, virtually no violence whatsoever by the workers. As a matter of fact, they had workers out patrolling the streets uh, to act as police to protect property, railroad property, as well as uh, as people. So there really was no violence in St. Louis, and yet they were bringing in machine guns, uh, uh, federal troops, militias, uh, all of these things over people that were really just on strike. Yeah. Could, I mean, we've touched on a, a bit of this, but just to give people, you know, understanding, could you just give us like, you know, the general timeline of how long this lasted and, you know, how the occupation was sort of like organized, um, uh, you know, to sort of fill in the roles of, you know, government or, you know, civil society during this period of time? Well, <clears throat> the strike and the St. Louis Commune didn't last all that long. Um, the St. Louis Commune lasted really only a week. And at the end of that time, um, what, what basically happened in St. Louis was, Railroad workers went on strike. The Workingmen's Party took control of it. They had these massive meetings every night, 20,000 people marching through the streets. Uh, they had the speeches by all these different people. They had three different stands, one uh, or four different stands, one in somebody speaking in German, one speaking in Bo uh, 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 Bohemian, one speaking in French, English. Uh, so because a lot of these workers didn't speak English, you know, mm -hmm. and so they had they had, they had about 20,000 people at these meetings, these mass meetings and uh, uh, and then marches through the street, torchlight parades uh, every night. So this goes on uh, for a few days. The whole city is, is shut down. Uh, the city government didn't know what to do, so they didn't do anything. And ultimately, the workers move into city hall and take over the city and they begin running the city services. Uh, and uh, uh, companies whose workers were on strike, a lot of them had goods that were, gonna, that were perishables, and they wanted to do something with them before they rotted. So instead of going to the city, they went to the Working Men's Party Executive Committee, and they said, you know, can we open up for four hours or one day and do this, you know, so this stuff doesn't perish? And they gave them permission to do it. And one place was... Belcher Sugar, which was a big, big sugar manufacturing company. And uh, uh, when he got permission to run his factory, uh, the executive committee, the Workmen's Party, sent out 40 workers to accompany him, to protect him, to get his, his factory running again. And uh, he asked for a big cheer uh, in support of the Working Men's Party for allowing him to do that. So they were running the city and they were, uh, mm -hmm. they were, uh, they were, they were making the decisions and they were operating the city. Now, after a few days, um, the uh, rich people in the city uh, got on the mayor and said, you know, what are you doing? You know, these workers are taking control. They're gonna take our businesses. They're gonna take our property. And what they did is uh, they started organizing a militia in the city. And uh, the militia was made up of rich people uh, and the people who worked for them. And uh, they mm -hmm. forced their, their employees to join the militias. And uh, one company forces employees to join them, but then deducted their pay for the time they served in the militia because they weren't working wow. for them that day. So they, uh, they put together these militias. The sheriff then uh, ordered all uh, uh, adult males to re uh, report for posse duty uh, uh, on threat of uh, a jail if they didn't. And so they uh, uh, they brought in arms. They 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 raided gun stores. They, uh, the federal government sent in arms. The state sent in arms. And uh, ultimately, after about a week, uh, they uh, marched on the headquarters of the executive committee of the Working Men's Party, uh, who were not expecting it, and uh, were unprepared for it, and they didn't have any guns, 
I think they found three guns maybe in the place. And uh, But the people marching on the headquarters uh, had artillery. Uh, they had a cavalry. Uh, and uh, uh, and they, uh, they arrested everybody there. And that was pretty much the end of the... Uh, of the St. Louis Commune. So the, the problem with the Commune was that, um, you know, and it's a problem that, that in this country that I think any kind of movement like that is going to have to face, and that is that um, is violence going to achieve your goal? And, uh, you know, let's say that they had used violence and totally taken over the city of St. Louis. How long before the federal government came in and crushed them the way the French government did to the Paris Commune, you know. Mm -hmm. So if, if violence isn't really the solution uh, uh, for your problems, uh, what is? You, well, I would say that organizing on a massive scale and the threat of a general strike and so on would would be much more effective. Uh, but uh, but they weren't they they weren't armed. Uh, one worker said, you know, complaining about the executive committee said they were a bunch of fools that if they had taken the armory in town. Uh, they could have done it uh, with uh, 50 men, and uh, that would have been that. Uh, but instead, the uh, um, the richer people took the armory, and um, and they had federal weapons, and they bought weapons. They had a lot of money to buy weapons. They collected money among themselves and bought thousands of arms. And, uh, uh, you know, it was totally one-sided, and uh, uh, and the end was not not really violent. I mean, they came in. Uh, people jumped out of windows, you know, tried to run away. They arrested everybody in the building. Three quarters of the people were, you know, in the wrong place at the wrong time. And uh, some of the people they arrested were uh, uh, reporters for the newspapers. And uh, in East St. Louis, when they did that, they arrested the city marshal, you know. Um, so, I mean, they just they just swept in and arrested everybody mm -hmm. they could they could find in the building. And, uh, and that was pretty much the end of it. So... It didn't last that long, but it raises an interesting question because at the time of the St. Louis Commune, the federal government, after the Civil War, it couldn't afford to keep the army intact. I mean, it had a massive mm. army for the Civil War, right? So they couldn't afford to keep it intact. So the army in 1877 only consisted of 15,000 men, and most of those were on the frontier fighting Indians. Mm -hmm. So the question is, you know, could they have put down the Commune with force? Um, so all of these are historical questions that, uh, people that, uh, don't work honestly for a living can debate for years to come, you know? <laughs> but, uh, but it raises interesting questions to talk about anyway. Yeah. And, uh, another thing, you know, you mentioned the, uh, how similar the red baiting sounds to like what we'd see over like the past century. Also the race baiting, uh, very similar, like, you know, you're collaborating with black people to help end civilization, that, that sort of thing. Uh, and touch a little bit on that and nativism as, you know, I imagine um, a bunch of radical Germans um, and other folks threatening property might uh, make people, uh, the uh, people in power think a little bit more strongly about nativism. Well, you know, in St. Louis, 60% of the population is born in a foreign country. And we're in a, a period of uh, extreme nativism uh, with all these uh, immigrants coming in. You've got the know-nothings who uh, hate Catholics, mm -hmm. who hate foreigners, and... Uh, uh, there were riots and uh, and uh, violent fights between them and uh, um, and uh, immigrants uh, when immigrants tried to vote, for example. Um, they hated black people, of course, uh, and uh, uh, and and so you had uh, uh, you had this Native Americans suspicion of foreigners that, of course, even occurs today, right? Um, that they, they come in, they're different than you and I are, and uh, at least for a generation or two anyway. Uh, they're different than we They speak a different language. They eat different foods, you know, and their culture is different, and uh, they're going to ruin our country, you know. And, uh, and so you had a lot of that at the time. And, and, you know, St. Louis was a very racist city, as most were at the time, and it was very much divided. The Germans were very, very anti-racist, uh, but, you know, St. Louis was also made up of Southerners uh, who lived there, and uh, uh, and they were very racist. And so, uh, as a result, um, when the black people joined the whites, united uh, in the strike, they marched together, they served on the executive committee, blacks did. Um, 
the newspapers in St. Louis went crazy with mm -hmm. these black words marching through the streets, you know, and so on and so forth. And, uh, um, you know, they used the N word, but they didn't put N dash, 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 you know, in the newspaper itself. I mean, they just spelled it out. And the uh, they were very, very racist. And they really made an attempt to divide the American workers from the foreigners that came in with this foreign philosophy of socialism mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and the black people, you know. Um, St. Louis was was didn't have a whole lot of black people until the Civil War, and then a lot of people, a lot of blacks escaping the South, um, moved north along the river, at, from Mississippi especially, and ended up in St. Louis, you know. And that was going to continue even years later, uh, just the move north. You know, the Carolina blacks ended up in New York, and the Alabama blacks ended up in Detroit, and the Mississippi blacks ended up in St. Louis. You know, you got. You, you went north at the shortest possible route you could find. And uh, uh, for St. Louis, it was uh, people from Mississippi largely. Uh, so there was this influx of black people and there were a lot of Irish because the, the Irish potato famine in the 18, late 1840s, uh, those people moved to, to the United States and to St. Louis also. Uh, the Irish were second to the Germans as far as an immigrant group in St. Louis. And the Irish, whereas the Germans that came came to St. Louis were largely educated. The Irish were not. They were more of uh, unskilled workers. And so they were in competition with the blacks moving into the city. So there was a lot of racism between the Irish and, uh, and the hmm. uh, black people. And even religiously, the Lutheran church uh, in, uh, in St. Louis was, was very, uh, very conservative and very racist. Uh, for example, the Wisconsin Synod of the Lutheran church was against slavery. The Missouri Synod was in favor of slavery, supported the South. Mm. And uh, uh, so you had uh, all of these factors um, that, uh, that uh, encouraged uh, racist beliefs and actions in the city at the time. It was a struggle. And they, they say if it weren't for the Germans, uh, Marx said if it weren't, wasn't for the Germans, uh, uh, Missouri would have joined the Confederacy. So it was those anti-slavery uh, Germans in St. Louis. Remember, a third of the population is born in Germany, and most of them, mm -hmm. are, most of them, but a good share of them are radicals and revolutionaries. Um, they kept the North uh, in the Union um, yeah, as a uh, 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 kept Missouri in the Union. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, just not surprising. I mean, th there's a you know history here that wasn't successful, obviously, but like um, you know of of German abolitionists in Texas who like it was immediate clash. The problem with them is they were completely outnumbered. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I believe that for sure. Yeah, yeah. But um, in in the last couple of minutes, unless you had anything um, else you want to jump on, Matt, I, I wanted to to talk about the this veiled prophet thing because it is sort of oh, fascinating right. the history. Um, you know, because th there's a, immediately after this this radical moment, there is uh, <laughs> a kind of need from the rich and, and ruling class in the area to sort of show their power and remind people, um, you know, who's running the show. I mean, could you talk about the beginning of the Veiled Prophet organization yeah. and, yeah, break that down for us? You know, in the 19th century, the streets were the place. It was a public sphere and mm -hmm. people went into the streets and they had parades and marches and that kind of stuff. And that was entertainment. And it was, well, you know, you didn't have telephones and, and uh, email and all that sort of thing. So that was how you got your message across. And during the uh, St. Louis Commune, uh, there were 20,000 workers marching every single night uh, in the city. Uh, even the barbers in St. Louis went on strike. And they uh, they had marches between behind uh, uh, drum and fife corps, you know, and so on. So all of these people were in the streets during the, uh, during the existence of the St. Louis Commune. Well, when the Commune was suppressed, the rich people in St. Louis, when I say that, it's the rich families, uh, came together and they held a big martial kind of parade, warlike parade. And they marched all these soldiers and militia people, you know, with, they marched them through the streets, you know, and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, to show their victory. Well, a few months later, a letter went out to some of the leading families in St. Louis. When I say the leading families, I mean even the the Choteau family, which was uh, uh, 
one of the original founders of the city back in the early 1700s, fur trader. Um, uh, a letter went out to the leading rich families in the city asking them to come to a secret meeting. And at the meeting, they created an organization called the Veiled Profit Organization. And it was for rich people and it was very limited to a small number of rich people. And the idea was that um, they, they, they created a world, uh, an exotic kind of world with a king, you know, and a prophet and all that sort of thing, mm. all dressed up. And the idea was they were going to have a parade every year and they were going to elect a veiled prophet every year. And the identity of the veiled prophet was supposed to be secret. But we know now that the first one was the police chief who suppressed the, uh, the St. Louis Commune. But uh, every year it's this really rich person. And so uh, the year after uh, the uh, suppression of the commune, they had a big party and a big parade through the streets. And they had floats because one of them had come from New Orleans and he had friends down there and he bought some floats from them. And they had these big floats and they were, uh, the floats were decorated like European royalty, you know, and the veiled prophet was wearing a uh, sheet with a, a white pillowcase over his head and he was carrying a machete or an ax, you know, um, uh, dressed up like a Ku Klux Klan person, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, and their idea was that they were going to have this parade every year to show that the streets did not belong to the people, it belonged to them. That there was a hierarchy in St. Louis and that they were at the top of the hierarchy, not the people that had controlled the streets up till then. And so they had that big, I mean, a big parade that first year. And every year since then, 1870, 1878 to the present, every year since then, they have a big veiled prophet ball where they introduce their daughters to society, deputants, you know, and uh, so they can meet other rich people, you know, to marry. And uh, they put on a big parade and have a big party for the masses. And through the years, um, they've continued that, uh, but they've changed the names. They At one point, there was some July 4th celebration. Then they renamed it the VP Fair, just like um, British Petroleum became BP, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't would, need to spell it. Yeah, say the yeah, whole thing. Nobody <laughs> would know that it was British Petroleum because it's <laughs> a bad name at that point. So the Vale Prophet became the VP Fair, you know. And uh, they put on that that parade every year since then, and that uh, and nobody in St. Louis. Well, first of all, most people had never heard of the St. Louis Commune, but mm -hmm. certainly nobody knew the origins of the VP Fair. That it was meant to show the people of St. Louis uh, that they were nothing, that the rich people were at the top of the hierarchy, that they controlled the city, and most importantly, they controlled the streets. So to this day, now. That's been exposed just recently uh, where, uh, um, uh, what, what's that woman's name? I forgot her uh, name. Ellie Kemper. Kemper. Yeah, where, uh, you know, she's criticized for taking part in that, like a 17-year-old girl should know what she's doing when her parents tell her to buy a new dress and have her hair done and <laughs> come out, uh, you know, that yeah. she's supposed to know the whole history of this when nobody else in the city knows the history of it. <laughs> yeah. you know? That's how well they've hidden it. So that uh, it's it's like uh, it's like they hired this uh, this firm, you know, to clean up their image, and all of a sudden they're these uh, great uh, throwing this great party for all the people of uh, St. Louis, and nobody knows the origins of it was uh, uh, to suppress the working class. It's interesting. I mean, true. I mean, it truly is fascinating. I mean, it's something yeah. I feel like like Adorno would have a field day with. Or, yeah. <laughs> it's like a reverse shadow of the yeah. of the commune, basically. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Well, they were much more successful than the commune was. Yeah, right. That's, the, yeah. that's the unfortunate truth, right? Yeah. 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 So, Lord. I mean, it's this is such a, a fascinating history. I mean, I really appreciate you, you know, joining us to to shed some light on it. People should definitely check out the book. Um, it it really breaks down all these dynamics really uh, in depth. Well, I, I appreciate you inviting me. The, uh, you know, I was just going to write something about the St. Louis Commune and what had happened, and uh, and as I got into it, I said, wow, you know, this goes back further, 
and it, mm -hmm. it went all the way back to Germany, and it went back to Karl Marx, and it went back to the German Revolution, and all these German immigrants coming to St. Louis. And so I saw that it was a lot more complicated than it looked originally, uh, and it was a very interesting history that uh, that really nobody knew much about. And it kind of it does. It's one part of the of the story of American labor and the attempt by workers to create a better life for themselves. You know. Absolutely. So, well, thank Mark you. For the opportunity. Yep, the book is The St. Louis Commune of 1877 Communism in the Heartland. Go uh, out and buy it, folks. Thank you so much, Mark. Hey, thank you, man. Thank you, David.